Hedra Helix. Beyond being what I would pick as my Star Trek name if I were on Star Trek, Hedra Helix is the Latin name for something you might know as English Ivy. I don't know about you, but when I think about English Ivy, I think about how blessed I've been and privileged I've been to travel the world and to see English Ivy in many beautiful places. It commonly adorns castles in Europe, especially. And if you travel during the fall, which is my favorite time to travel, we get to see the ivy turn, and we get these brilliant rainbows of colors climbing up these stoic buildings. And it turns out, ivy makes a pretty good Instagram backdrop. <laughs> ivy has a long and rich history of symbolism. The Romans once believed that ivy could provide us with a hangover cure, which is why you see my boy Bacchus here. Um, he was a pretty big drinker. Uh, he, he would often wear an ivy crown before he hit a night on the town with his boys. He didn't have vitamin water then, so. <laughs> ivy wasn't just for drinking. It was always also believed to keep thoughts inside of your brain, which is why if you notice poets and statues of poets and other scholars, that ivy wreaths were often worn to keep those intelligent thoughts in. Should probably try that. But most pertinently to today, ivy was also thought to fend off evil spirits. It was placed along the sides of walls and to climb trellises of our castles as a way to protect them. So it made sense when European colonizers came to America, they brought it with them. And I want to take a moment here to acknowledge that there is unceded land that we are standing upon as we learn and grow over these two days. The Ohlone and Costoan people um, are, live here in the Bay and Monterey Bay regions. And Ohlone is a term used by anthropologists in order to connect 56 unique tribes through their linguistic similarities and their cultural similarities. And for over 200 years, the Ohlone and Costone people endured so much um, grief and and, and heartache due to Mexican and Spanish and American settlers. So I just want to take that moment to acknowledge that that's the land that we're on today and to thank them for it. So back to the colonizers. They brought English ivy with them, and what they didn't realize, that English ivy, like the colonists themselves, were an invasive species. Because of that, English ivy grew with no bounds. It had no natural predators. It grew up trees. It grew across forest floors, killing everything in sight. And the funny thing about it, I studied environmental science, is that English ivy is not considered a parasite. You might be thinking, what a parasitic thing to do. It's not, because a parasite has to actually leach something out of its host. That's not what English ivy does. Instead, it covers them from the sun. It removes their nourishment. It takes up all of the land and spreads like wildfire. And the limit to English ivy does not exist. This was a stretch, by the way, because I <laughs> reference Mean Girls in every talk I do, and now it's become a thing I have to do. And it wasn't until I was like, I should probably get going to my talk that I realized English ivy, the limit does not exist, of course. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> and the saddest part about English ivy is that the thing that allows it to grow are birds. Birds carry the berries of English ivy far away, allowing it to spread even further than it normally would. And the saddest part is that it kills these birds. Many of these birds, if they were to ingest the berry, would die, including starlings which you all know a little bit more about, thanks to Ethan's talk. So English ivy also can survive on the dead vines of its ancestors, and they can grow atop each other, creating what's called an ivy desert. And I would know this because I'm from the Pacific Northwest, where English ivy grows very well. And studying environmental sciences was the most common thing that they had us do for our field trips, 
was to go do English IV uh, extra, um, ex extracting. There we go. And it's something that one of my old coworkers or colleagues is in the audience today, and I think she'll remember that we had to do this together as well. But it wasn't just after I started environmental science that I knew about this, because this was something that my mom made me do in our own backyard. I don't know if you've noticed, I'm Asian, which means that my parents saw me less as a child and more as labor that owed them infinitely for the gift of childbirth. And unfortunately, unlike children today, I did not have access to the internet, I'm that old. So um, I just tried to figure out how to do it. My mom wrote me the pithiest brief I've ever received in my career, which is to clear the ivy. Thanks, mom. So that's what I did. I went out with shears similar to this WikiHow page, which I did not have access to, it would have been helpful, um, and I just cut the ivy with shears went about my summer, learning how to kickflip, drop, um, drop into rams, that's what I was really into as a teen. And uh, when I, at the end of the summer, as I was really good at those kickflips and dropping into ramps, my mom said, hey, have you looked at the backyard lately? No? Well, it had all grown back. And this was me. <laughs> what the fuck? I wasn't allowed to cuss until I turned 18, but what the fuck? And so I realized that was taking the wrong strategy, that cutting the IV wasn't going to work, and that instead I needed to trace the IV. I needed to pull it out from its roots, and so that's what I did. With a few weeks of summer left, I traced each root of IV back, and by the end I had this big ball, similar to her. And what I realized was that I was at an impasse, that all of the ivy, I couldn't trace it to its core because unfortunately, it was under our house. So if I wanted to extract this ivy, I would need to pull our house up in order to um, extract it. So I just cut it as closely as I could to the foundation. <laughs> so here today, under this house, was the real problem to solve. Hello. My name is Tatiana Mack, and I'm here to talk to you about systems of systems. And we can't talk about systems without talking about design systems. We can't talk, we can't talk about design systems with, without acknowledging our elders, one of whom we heard earlier this morning in a pink pantsuit, and also another one who's running this conference today. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge how much Gina does for the design systems community. She has put tireless hours into running this conference. She cares about every single detail, the lanyards, the waters. She wants to make sure that every single person in this room has a great experience here. And I'm glad to hear, seeing on Twitter, that so many of you feel that energy, that this is a kind conference, and that comes straight from Gina. So as you can imagine, when Gina told me that she wanted me to speak at Clarity 2019, I was freaking out. I was so excited. And then when she told me she wanted me to be the first person that she announced, I was even more excited. Because in this industry, I'm not often seen like that in the way that Gina saw me. And Gina and Mina and other women of color in this industry so often have our work erased. So to have her acknowledge me and to have me here on the stage today is a huge honor. So I'd love to give her a thank you and a round of applause for doing that. So, back to design systems. <laughs> so, we think of design systems, we might think about a drop-down, feeding into a form pattern, feeding into a product registration. This might sound familiar to one of the MCs in this room, the idea of taking an atom, growing it into a molecule, and then into an organism. I'd like to extend the organism, though, into beings. That's what our products are. I'd like to extend it a step further into the ecosystem, which is this industry. And then, one more step, this industry and how it fits into the world or our society. 
So usually when we're building a design system, we build it from atom to molecule to organism, to being to ecosystem to world. And for a moment, I'm going to ask you to flip that around. We are going to look at the ways in which we can build at scale, right? We love saying that. If we build this way, we can build at scale. I'm going to ask us to all flip that around today. We're going to look at the systems of the world and how they trickle into our ecosystems, down to our beings, into our organisms, our molecules, to down to our very atoms. And to do that, I'm going to use a model from everyone's favorite podcaster, Ira Glass. We're going to use the format of a three-act play. Act one, wealth. That was my best Ira Glass. That's all I got. <laughs> so let's look at the word mortgage. I'm a huge etymology nerd. Mortgage. If we break up mortgage, and who here has a mortgage? Cool. A lot lower because we live in the Bay. But this, this, uh, this might resonate with you. Mortgage, if you break it down, comes from mortis, which means death. <laughs> it gets worse, y'all. We go to gage, which is French for pledge. <laughs> Putting it all together, a mortgage is a death pledge. <laughs> and I want you to get out your laughs now, because it's funny to us, but the history of the mortgage is quite dark. When we think of mortgages, we think of homes, right? But that's not where they came from. No, mortgages were created for enslaved peoples. Colonists use mortgages in order to profit off of enslaved bodies. Same with loans. And this was in the South, primarily in South Carolina and Virginia, and they, they found a way to basically create infinite wealth. So they would draft a mortgage, and then someone would co-sign it, usually a friend, and they would keep this circle going, trading, um, buying, buying more enslaved peoples without uh, any wealth accrued. Because what they did was that they didn't really document this. They just kind of did it, and it was all privatized. It wasn't connected to the banks at all. You could go to the banks to pay off your loans, but it was a completely separate entity altogether. They kept their own record books, or rather didn't. When we think about slavery, I think we so often think about the slavery of the South, like I just told you there. And we don't think about the slavery of the North, and that's by design. Many of us went to school here in the United States, and I'm sorry to those Europeans who maybe got the right story, or, or, or non-Americans, I should say, who got the right story. But here, we don't get the right story. We are told that the Civil War was about slavery, and it was not, in fact, about slavery. The Civil War was about state sovereignty versus federal authority. That was the battle they were fighting. And slavery was just one example, and the right to determine what counted as slavery was what they were fighting about. It was just a glorified example, but it stuck. So here, I'm going to educate you a little bit about the slavery of the North. So, Stepping into New York at the time, they were what were called city slaves. And I just want to make a distinction that when I say city slaves, I believe that we need to use the term enslaved peoples because uh, there's a lot of reasons. You can Google it. You can do the emotional labor. But if I say city slave, um, that's not my belief. I think we always need to say enslaved people. But the enslaved people of the city, like in New York, um, were allowed to do a lot more than plantation enslaved people. They were allowed to run errands. They had a lot of autonomy, and many of them even searched for their own jobs. And they would you know, wait in the street in order to find more work. Um, and they would gather to do that. It makes sense. And for those of you who live in communities with migrant workers, you might, that might be familiar to you. And the North, which at the time was still counted itself as liberal, was like, well, we're fine with that idea, but we don't like them hanging around in groups. It gives us racial anxiety. It's a familiar term to me. And so what they did was they said, all right, they're all gathering, so let's set some rules around it. Let's, in fact, take all Negro and Indian slaves that are let out to hire, um, and they would be hired at the market house at Wall Street. 
ship. That's where they hung out. Slip, excuse me. That was in 1711 when that happened. And that street is Wall Street. The entire stock exchange that many of you have shares in today was created for the trading of enslaved peoples. And they wanted to trade them rapidly so that it was harder for them to do what? I'm sorry, Ethan, it made it harder for them to unionize. The wealth of enslaved peoples was so grand that it surpassed seven times the cumulative wealth of banks and railroads. And that might be hard for us to fathom because railroads in America are worth nothing anymore. And again, sorry to any non-Americans with nice train systems that come here, we don't invest in our railroads here. And they built it on undocumented wealth. And I don't know about you, but I feel like this country has a lot of feelings about things being undocumented. So 1711 to 2019, not that much has changed. So many companies like Aetna, New York Life, companies that you might have your life insurance policies in, were founded for and traded against enslaved people. And just now, this was issued in 2000, so not even 20 years ago, they finally apologized for their role in it in the 1850s. And many companies have never apologized for this. And not much has changed, particularly when you look at who becomes wealthy. In fact, looking at S&P 500, which is the top 500 traded, or top wealthiest companies that are traded on Wall Street, the average CEO of those 500 companies is $14.5 million. What better way to look at the wealth difference than to look at the ratio to an average worker? 287 to 1. Think about that. Take your own salary right now. Multiply it by 287. That's what an average CEO makes today. Act two, productivity. I think we'd all agree that we have a productivity-obsessed culture. We make apps to make things better and to make us do things faster, and we're always just trying to, to maximize our time and our resources. And we have this man to thank, Thomas Affleck. Thomas Affleck invented um, what uh, and as a note for Thomas Affleck, I just want to call attention to the fact that he kind of looks like Ben Affleck. <laughs> and you all know that we always forget Casey, so yeah, he looks like Casey too. <laughs> Thomas Affleck wrote the book called The Cotton Plantation Record and Account Book, and it is one of the most brilliant books in the sense that he found ways to keep records on enslaved peoples, their productivity, how many resources they were taking up, and tracking uh, every single minute of their day in these ledger formats. That might sound familiar to you for those of you who keep timesheets. And in fact, so many of the tools that he created within this little book are tools that we still use today. And the infrastructure of, of plantations and middle management and the way that middle management receives some power, but not all, that's all by design. That all came from slavery. Time tracking, tasks, direct reports, all of these are concepts derived from slavery. Reorging, reorging so you can't unionize, timed meals, regulating your breastfeeding, all those systems are still here today. And so when he wrote this cotton plantation record book, um, it was okay to have slaves where he was enslaved peoples where he was from. But then he realized, I can sell this to more neoliberal people from the north if I just do a rebrand. So he rebranded it to the farmer's record and account book. And I'm just, I think that he should be grateful that he's not in the age of Twitter, because can you imagine, we are so mean about rebrands in this agency, we would have a heyday with this one. When in his, um, a lot of the, the behaviors, like I said, from plantations are still here today, including some good things, well, maybe, which is that uh, the enslaved peoples who worked harder got cash incentives to work harder, like a bonus. But then what they did was they took those new bars and made them the new minimum. So you had to work that hard or else you would get whipped. 
and then they would glorify that employee for a second. And they would analyze year over year how they could improve their profits. These terms might sound familiar to you all here. And not much has changed. I love this, I love hate this tweet from Public Citizen that lists all these flags of the world and says weeks of paid maternity leave, which by the way should be parental leave. Oh, and then all the way at the bottom we have an ellipse. That's awful. You know it's bad when there's an ellipse before you. Zero. These are the tools of exploitation. These are the tools of oppression. And not much has changed. Not much has changed from the people who write them, either. And the strategy hasn't changed. That all of these tools are used to make the richest, richy, rich, richer. So Act 3, our own. So I do a little bit of design work, which I think, and development work, which I think often gets uh, overshadowed by my uh, social justice -y work. <laughs> but this was one of those rare days where I wasn't out with my bandana doing that terrorist Antifa stuff that I do. Um, and I was behind my computer like a diligent little worker bee, and I, noticed, um, I needed to build a contact spread in, Fig in Framer X. So I used this plugin called Tiny Faces. I had this big spread, and I, you know, uh, clicked it, and I had, looking back at me, a bunch of chads, sorry, brads, and tads. There were no non-women. Then I dug a little deeper, like, that's weird. I mean, I know that there's gross negligence in our industry, but, like, there's got to be a way to change this. So I looked into the settings, and this, what you might be seeing here is that gender true generates men or male-presenting people. Gender false generates non-male and non-male presenting people. And it made so much sense, all those years of the internet being told that I was wrong. There was a reason now. My gender is false. <laughs> and then, it doesn't stop there, because what does it say about non-binary people? It says, you don't exist. And so I dug into this. Um, of course, me being a loud mouth, I tweeted about it. And what I learned through digging into the Facebook API, which is what Tiny Faces is built on, is this is how they define gender. The gender is selected by the person, male or female. If the gender is set to a custom value, which Facebook does have a lot of offerings for custom values, this value will be based off of the preferred pronoun. It will be omitted if the preferred pronoun, and preferred is listed twice there, uh, preferred pronoun is neutral. All right, I'm going to walk through this for you, what that means. That's saying male will present male, female will present female, non-binary will provide custom choices. So it depends. We love that phrase in this industry. So unpacking that further, if we look, he, him will present then to male, she, her will associate to female, and then they, them, or any other non-he, she, Pronouns will present to null, which is why the plugin only has two genders, despite there being a wealth of information on Facebook. And we have to make a note that gender does not equal gender pronouns, so they've already made an intrinsic mistake there. And, of course, me being a big mouth and tweeting about it, I got responses. One chad says, this is a bug, just report it. I'm sure they'll be thankful it's, it's missed their QA. And another Chad says, given that they've used in true false for type, just seems like lazy dev work more than anything. All right, cool. And I like the three assholes that like that tweet. <laughs> and what I like to say to them is, intent does not erase impact. I like to unpack this phrase, intent and impact. Intent focuses on the designers, and I mean designers in the capital D sense, all of us who create products. Impact is what focuses on our users, and I have an entire talk where I focus on this called Building Socially Inclusive Design Systems. It's not yet reported, but I will be presenting it in Helsinki um, on September, between September 3rd and 5th, so if you're able to make it out there and you're privileged enough to, I really hope you can. But back to our grid here. We have beings, which makes products, right, into our ecosystem, which feeds into society. So when we look at this definition, or this API call, we need to see what's happening here. 
that we have an exclusionary ecosystem that sustains bad practices and defines systemic issues. That Facebook definition doesn't just feed into Max de Grev, Maxime de Grev's tiny faces. And by the way, don't send him hate. He handled it in one of the best ways possible when he found out about it. He dropped everything to fix it. And it's still not perfect because it hinges on the Facebook API, but it is better. And it was one of the best online interactions I've had. So don't send him hate mail. The exclusionary system sustains these bad practices, then it feeds into our atoms. So it feeds into that toggle selector that Maxime created. And it introduces that bad pattern that's driven by systemic flaws. And then we feed those atoms back into our design systems, which feeds back into the ecosystem, perpetuating these things. And we hurt a lot of people in the process with our positive feedback loop. And then we need to step out a step further and realize that these ecosystems of, of our industry are feeding into society. Again, we're introducing bad patterns driven by systemic flaws, and then we're feeding them into society, which sustains those bad, bad practices, sorry, bad practices, not Brad practices. Only you know how to do that, Brad. Um, <laughs> and the truth here is that our society hates transgender and non-binary people. This is a list of people transgender people who have been killed in 2019 alone. And I was really worried putting this up because why? I was worried that the list I had was incomplete because it happens so often. And all of these transgender people are trans black women. Back to the English Ivy. So we look about this and we trace it we often are looking at the leaves, the tips of the leaves of the English ivy. And then maybe we step back and we look at the leaves themselves. And maybe we step back and we see the whole branch. And that's how we build at scale. And what I'm here to tell you is that we've learned how to build hate at scale. Tech is not a vertical. It's a horizontal. So when I tried to define tech here, uh, it was really hard because we call tech an industry, and, and that it is. We have you know, our own workers and whatnot, um, but we, tr we touch every single industry. We have so much power, so we're our own industry, but then we also influence all the industries around us. We touch all of them in this way. And that's how we are multiplier. We intersect them, multiplying the effects of everything we do. And so when we put this all together, tech multiplies building hate at scale. So I told you it was a three-act play, but after the play now, we have to look at how we fix this. So I want to introduce you to another plant, Sequoia dendron gigantium. And I don't know how many of you have been to the Redwood Forest just north of us here, but it's one of the most beautiful places in the world, and they're full of these sequoias. They're magnificent. You might also know them as redwoods. So what's super magnificent, I really wish that I would have listened to Harry's um, preloading strategies before my talk. <laughs> Sorry, Harry. Uh, well, we'll move on. So you can imagine, I, I hope someone's taking a screenshot of this for Harry so he can roast me in his next talk. But um, Sequoia dendron giganteums, or redwoods, can grow up to 113 feet wide, which is 34 meters for you people that actually believe in using a sensible system. <laughs> or it can be 286 feet tall or 87 meters. And they can live to 1,800 to 2,700 years. Such magnificent beings. But they are not immune. English ivy can overtake these trees. And it can overtake them to such a degree that it kills them. And so what you're seeing here um, on that edge is that thick layer is English ivy. Look at how thick those roots are compared to the thickness of the redwood. I mean, if, I don't know if you, when you were a kid you had to count rings, but that's hundreds of years of thickness that, these, that English ivy has very quickly overtaken. So back to this analogy. It's amazing that that's what could happen, that my mother thought I, a young, very weak child, 
could extract this from under our house. But it taught me a lesson. The under that house was the real problem to solve. I'm going to deliver on my promise. So to do that, we need to chase the vines. Said another way, we need to chase the green, and we all operate under a capitalist system. Even for those of you from socialist countries, the influence of capitalism is still very strong. Chasing the green means chasing the money. So in everything that we do, in every atom we create and feed it into the molecules, we need to assess those by chasing the money. Who is profiteering off of our labor and at what cost? I hope you all listened to Ethan's talk where he showed you what the cost is. Very real human lives still, and slavery still exists abundantly. Under this house is where we hide the roots of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. So we must lift this house, and we must pull it by its roots, and we must kill it before it kills us. We must cut off the sunlight to this vitriolic vines of hate. And as James Baldwin reminds us, nothing can be changed until it is faced. We must end racism, ableism, sexism, anti-queer, anti-trans behavior in the past and in our present. We need to acknowledge the fact that slavery and colonization is part of our past. And sadly, the things that we, it's, it's one of the like, saddest things to me is because we can't get past the effects, as I've shown you today, and all these micro patterns that we're pushing, these pixels, and, and we can't get past it, but it also seems to be the thing that we can't seem to remember. We don't talk about this. We act like after Abe Lincoln got up there with his big ass hat, everything was fine. But thankfully, we're starting to, the work of black and brown women and non-binary people. For those of you who haven't seen, the 1619 Project just launched from the New York Times. It's beautiful and sad. And what it is, is it looks at the ways in which slavery still connects to modern capitalism. So while I was very happy when this launched two days ago, I knew what I was talking about, and I was like, fuck. Everyone's going to think that I just copied this series. But I hope that you all read this series because it is very important work. It is highlighting the ways in which these systems, I only covered a few of the ways in which these systems permeate through our everyday lives under capitalism. But the New York Times is going to continue to put out this work. And what they say is it's an invitation to reframe how the country discusses the role and history of its black citizens. You all need to do the work. As James Baldwin told us, we need to confront things and we need to understand them. So we need to start talking about not only race, which is what I focus on in this slide, but we need to talk about our ableism. We need to talk about our sexism. We need to talk about the ways in which we are anti-queer and anti-trans because all of those people are the ones that were most marginalized first during the Holocaust. That's what we're seeing today. So follow black and brown women and non-binary people. Listen to podcasts. Read their books. Sorry, Harry. And we have to acknowledge our privilege. We all have privilege. I have immense privilege. We all have a privilege of being here, of working in this industry, of being able to talk about these things somewhat safely in these rooms today. And we need to recognize that our privilege is not our fault, but it is our responsibility. And I do want to say that for the able-bodied, white, cis, heteronormative people in the room who are neurotypical, who are wealthy, I am talking to you. You need to do more of this work. Because, as Angela Davis tells us, if they come for me in the morning, they're going to come, or if they come for, did I get that right? <laughs> yes, I did. If they come for me in the morning, they're going to come for you in the night. And what that's saying is that all of us feel the ill effects of white supremacy. Some of us just feel it first. I wrote an article for a list apart called Cannery in a Coal Mine. And that's often how I feel being a queer woman of color in this industry. I've sung my song, as I have today, and it's up to you all, minors, to listen. So I invite you today, let's be Redwoods. Let's learn for our fallen ancestors. Protect our most vulnerable. And something I didn't tell you earlier, <laughs> come on, Harry, help me out here. What that's supposed to be a photo of, and this is a good lesson in alt text, I hope you listen to Marcy's talk, 
is that these are um, the redwoods, despite being so majestic and tall and living so long, they have very shallow roots. So how they compensate is they join roots. So I invite us here to stand tall and to join roots. As Ethan tells us, unionizing is one of those ways. And as Angela Davis reminds us, we must learn to lift as we climb. And I ask to build upon her words. And I say that we must learn to join as we grow. And I hope we do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I also want to just sort of recognize as like, sort of feel tingly and uncomfortable and I'm only just now starting to get. <laughs> Making this way easier for me. No, I just, I, I did, I wanted to say, all right, can I move over there? Is that all right? Okay, all right. You do the work, Brad. All right, thank you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that that's such an important lesson. And again, as someone who, it's like, this is a process, this is education, and like just only in like, it, this ongoing process of being uncomfortable and learning how to confront that discomfort, especially as like someone who has a, an abundance of privilege, as you're, as you're saying. So it's like, I j thank you for, for putting us in that position. I just, I guess, wanted to sort of recognize that for, for all of us. It's like, let's sit in that discomfort and sort of recognize, like, why, why do we feel this uncomfortable about this and all, and all of that? But I, I, I do want to get into some of this stuff because, I mean, you're talking about overcoming hundreds of years of these systems that are just so hard-coded and baked into our society. And it just seems so freaking overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, like an insurmountable task. Like we do in our own work and, you know, the <laughs> what's, you know, just totally pithy or like whatever by comparison, breaking these sort of big things into smaller pieces is something we're getting good at. Like, how, how have you sort of thought about these, you know, massive societal problems and have sort of broken them down into like smaller, smaller pieces that, that we could act on, you know, today, like, like one step at a time, one, you know, like how, how do you think about that? And then also like, do you have any advice for, for other folks, like as we go back into the office, like in the, like the next couple of days, mm -hmm. it's like, what are those like smaller, what, what are those first steps that we can take to start tackling these gigantic issues? I think it's a little bit different um, because we have to recognize the place in which we stand, right? I think it's a little bit different for everyone. I think for people that are repeatedly harmed by this, it's about caring for ourselves mm. and not necessarily feeling the burden of doing this work, which is a catch-22 because we, we feel the burden of doing this work because we, feel, we experience the ill effects of it. But for people that are most privileged, and you said it yourself, maybe you. <laughs> That's, I mean, Chad, Brad. Yeah, it rhymes. I mean, like, Gina planned this <laughs> event so well, because I always, like, for years, I've been calling them Chads, and it's just, like, just a little different. Like, you're a little bit better than a Chad, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, in reality, I think it is about seeing, like, that's why I use the design system. It's like, I think when we think about design systems, they are really overwhelming, right? Like if, yeah. if when we hear that task of build design systems, we're all design systems wonks, but we're so overwhelmed by that. So what do we do? We get to the molecular level. And I think it's just about learning how to analyze these situations and didn't do the preloading, so you couldn't see all the books, but um, reading the experiences of people that are different than you. And that doesn't just apply for race. Race is what I talk about most often, but it, it applies to, to disabled folks. Um, something I've been wanting to do is like inviting uh, a bunch of white guys on the internet to unfollow everyone on Twitter and then to only follow marginalized people. Yeah. Because I think that that's part of it, is that the 1619, not to troll everyone I talked to, but the 1619 project came out and my feed was lit 
people were like, you gotta read this. And I come here, talking to a few people, and I'm like, shit, I think my talk is hosed because this has been launched, and everyone's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm not trolling those people. I love you all who I talked to who said that. But it's true. It's that we're not surrounding ourselves with enough of this to see those patterns yourselves. Like, I can point out the patterns I've seen today, and I hope that I've been able to teach everyone to see them. But it, it applies to every single thing we do. Like, I want everyone, if you have a, a website and you collect gender, first I want you to think about why you collect gender. And if you're informing your users of how you're storing their data and using it, but then I also want you to look if it's a drop down to see if mail is listed first. Those are the tiny ways in which we perpetuate things. And I will guess that most of you don't have non binary, and you might have a third, but it'll say other. And what does that do that other is non binary people? So that's what I need people to do is to look at the smallest things. I don't need you to solve white, though, I don't need you to dismantle. Um, uh, the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy as a whole, I need everyone to recognize their tiny little bricks and for everyone to just pull those bricks out like Jenga. Because if we can pull enough bricks out like Jenda, Jenga, that wall will fall. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, Hey, you mentioned you mentioned books and reading, and then there's you know, you know you talk about history, you talk about all this stuff, and and you know like the, for a lot of people it's such a cold shower. It's like, how how do you see education and all of this? And that's like something that I, I try to sort of balance you know myself as I, uh, like I'm on my own journey to like discovering this, and again like being in increasingly uncomfortable because it's like what I've been taught my entire life was like something entirely different. So it's like, how do you see like that sort of like educational aspect of it, like at, at more of like a systemic, you know, sort of like early on in people's lives, right? Like mm -hmm. sort of how that shapes sort of our behavior now, like how, how could we start overcoming that? I, I'm not trying to, maybe I shouldn't ask you about like, how do we change our school systems? But like, that, that seems like a big part of it is like, we, we're, we have to undo what we've already learned mm -hmm. in order to, to, to get better. And I, I don't know, like, beyond just like picking up some books now and starting to do it, but like, are, are there other sort of tactics or, or sort of strategies for like advocating at like a, a deeper level? Yeah, I think it happens with conversations that, it needs to be conversations with people that are close to us, right? That we, we can't convince some ding-dong on the internet. <laughs> um, but we can convince that ding-dong that we have Thanksgiving dinner with, and maybe we could invite them to stop throwing Thanksgiving dinners yeah. altogether. So I think that that's, that's where the work needs to happen is self-education, yes, but then in educating the people immediately around you and, 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 and holding them to task. Regarding school, I think that a huge thing is that being a people of color, especially, we have to talk about race for our survival from a very young age. And I know I have immense privilege in that because I'm light-skinned, I'm Asian-American, I fall into the minority, model minority myth, but like black young people have to have very serious conversations with their parents about their safety mm -hmm. and, and how to uh, behave around police officers to maximize their safety because they're constantly in harm. And so I would like for more white people to talk to their kids about race and about what privileges that come with their race. Um, education just doesn't happen only at school. Um, there are a lot, many ways that that needs to change too, which I can't solve in the two minutes that I probably <laughs> have here. Sure. But like, that, that is where it happens, is in ongoing education. When you're building a, if you're doing the di like daily UI project or, or any sort of illustration project, maybe focus it on around something that can teach people something. Yeah. I'm not saying everything has to be negative and, and sad all the time, we deserve joy, but we can use our privilege more in order to teach one another more because everything I said today is available but I imagine that many of you learned something I did in writing the talk that's great well keep up the great work and everyone Tatiana Mack